Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you for coming. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here with you. Uh, and I'm just delighted to share the stage with my colleague and friend, Sarah Lewis, and I'll discuss this important topic of vision and justice. I'm also thankful um, that she has edited such an important issue for Aperture. Uh, thank you as well to the board of trustees, the museum director, Susan Fisher Sterling, and Milani Douglas, along with everyone here at the National Museum of Women in the Arts who's helped to make this possible. I'd like to begin begin my brief remarks by showing a clip from a female filmmaker named Madeline Anderson. Many may never have heard of her, but she's a documentary filmmaker with an incredible film career uh, who worked with some of the most respected documentarians like Shirley Clark, Richard Leacock, and the Maisel brothers. Uh, she is one of the, who were all the pioneers of a genre called direct cinema. Uh, but uh, Madeline rarely received any of her own recognition. Um, so this film that I show, I want to show you, she filmed this documentary, I Am Somebody, in uh, the summer of 1969, during a time when race, gender, and class collided in South Carolina, and black health care workers protested for better wages. I feel that the black woman in our nation, the black working woman, is perhaps the most discriminated against of all of the working women. The black woman. And In this documentary, as I mentioned, uh, I wanted to show us this work that really brings to the to the fore um, uh, Coretta Scott King, in fact, in a way that we often don't even see her speaking sort of front and center. Uh, I thought it was also important to showcase this work because I recently honored the 91-year-old female filmmaker who made this work uh, at the National Museum of African American History and Culture during our first African American Film Festival. It was an important decision to sort of showcase and honor her, but also bring this clip to the fore because it was shot nearly 50 years ago. Um, and the message is a timeless one. It shows women at the forefront fighting for justice. Coretta Scott King had come down to South Carolina in support of these healthcare workers who had sacrificed their lives and their livelihood to go on strike to advocate for a living wage. To me, that's vision and justice. Um, this film shows King, as this is a short documentary, it shows King marching uh, in the front line, on the front lines, locked arms in arms with these women who had been, before she arrived, being brutalized and beaten and silenced. She came along with Andrew Young and Ralph Abernathy. Madeline Anderson came along as well, and at the time was pregnant. And she went down to make this film because as she told me, as a black, Working woman, a wife, and a mother, I knew their story. Their story was my story. And again, for her being a filmmaker, that meant showing the humanity and pride of black people and using the camera to combat injustice. And I think that is a tradition that is something that dates back centuries. So to move forward, I want to start by saying I started my career as a curator about two decades ago. I was drawn to museum work because I wanted to blend the practice of theory and practical application, but also because as a young girl growing up in Detroit, I would spend hours flipping through magazines and books trying to better understand the world around me. I loved the variety of images of black women I would see on album covers and books by black women writers like Toni K. Bambara, Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, just to name a few. But also there was a Diego Rivera mural at the Detroit Institute of Art 
art that was a source of pride and inspiration, not only because of its message of recognizing the working class, but its size and scale felt also like a vision of justice. These themes of recognizing the extraordinary in the ordinary, the power of the image as a window into humanity, and realizing representation matters are the critical ways in which I approach my curatorial practice. I also understand that life is a journey and having a strong sense of the past helps navigate the world as we move forward. So for me, that history is anchored in when and where I entered, uh, to borrow a phrase from womanist scholar Paula Giddens. And that takes me to my immediate family, my maternal great-grandmother, and my grandmother are both sources of inspiration. This image of my great-grandmother was taken around 1910, 11. She was originally from Frankfort, Kentucky, named Fanny Bell Martin. And she was a widow who had to raise my grandmother and worked in the factories. Um, but it was through that tireless work that she was able to raise enough money and purchase a home. In the shadows of this image of my grandmother and great-grandmother, you see the house that she used, that she created a safe space for blacks migrating uh, from the south to the north for better opportunities. This picture of my great-grandmother uh, and grandmother show, show for me a, a bitter, a beggar, a bigger, excuse me, sense of sort of one's humanity. These are the, the image I showed before as well as this image are not the images I knew of my grandmother and great-grandmother. However, they provide me with a better sense of understanding sort of this arc of history, this arc of justice, if you will, that is ever-reaching and quite broad. And it's an American story for me because it connects us to work, opportunity, resilience, fortitude, and these are things that are also of which I'm intimately connected. And so it's that sort of work that brings me to sort of the work I do at the museum. I also recognize that America is, a complicated, is complicated by her peculiar history. And it's a nation of promise and hope. And it's also a place that has kept a large swath of its citizens uh, on the legal and social margins. This image was the first image that welcomed me at my desk when I came to the museum almost six years ago. And I, I was struck by this 1850s tin type of this young girl, probably in her teens, and someone has taken the care to paint this work, hand paint the earrings and the necklace and the ring. Um, but it also reminded me of this phrase by W.E.B. Du Bois that describes this paradox, uh, the souls of, that he describes in his tomb, uh, the souls of black folks, where he wrote, one ever feels his tunis, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn as asunder. This young girl with her focused eyes clearly looks as though she is one of strength, fortitude, and resilience. And it's that focus that many African Americans have navigated and negotiated during this particular tension. And I think that photography is one medium that most effectively documents these noteworthy characteristics. So we have vintage photographs like this image, um, but we also have images like this that I find so powerful. This Zoom Lee image that was taken during the uprising in Ferguson uh, after the killing of Michael Brown. So agency and activism have become and have been seen as sort of has been seen through the power of the lens. Uh, as statesmen and abolitionist Frederick Douglass argued in 1865 of the photography's importance, particularly for African Americans, pictures fundamentally determine what it means to be human. But not only that, they also hold an important space in promoting social reform. 
Even in some of the most challenging moments in American history, the gaze, one's posture, a gesture, perhaps like a bended knee, <laughs> or an article of clothing can demonstrate a tradition of resilience and determination. According to Douglas, one of the most photographed men of the 19th century, um, <laughs> the power of the photograph is that it allows the subject to control the meaning and assert their citizenship. In other words, as feminist scholar Bell Hooks wrote, camera gave to black folks, irrespective of class, a means by which we could participate fully in the production of images. But it is also critical in my curatorial practice to include work that is only, not only ranging in scope, but it shows a variety of ages that have been involved, actively involved in vision, envisioning our justice. Um, but we also want to use the camera as a weapon against injustice. So these are just a few examples of the ways in which we have been collecting work. The previous work, as well as this one, is by the Baltimore photographer, Baltimore-based photographer Devin Allen during a uh, this was shot, or this photograph was taken during the uh, uprisings that took place after the shooting of Freddie Gray. I find it strikingly familiar and similar to this image by Don Hogan Charles of um, the, the of in this, that was taken in the summer of 1967 in Newark. Uh, and then you have these images again, by this one by Sheila Pre Bright, where you have young people, inner generations, fighting and arguing and using the camera and their voice to fight against uh, injustice. Uh, and again, historically, we can look to the past to think about what's happening now. We think of this Spider Martin image with, Jesse Je with um, John Lewis being confronted by the police or confronting the police. Or we have this one with the ultimate side eye that was given <laughs> by Gloria Richardson Dandridge, the freedom fighter from in Cambridge, Maryland, uh, where, as she was fighting for equal rights for um, housing and fighting against housing discrimination. All of these things, again, these were images from the 60s and from uh, the present, but they bring me to this image by J.P. Ball. And when I think about the significance of photography, I often give pause at the fact that black people have been agents in creating images for decades, be they still or moving. For some of the 19th century images, I'm struck when I see this beautiful one but of this woman that was taken place in Helen, taken in Helena, Montana, around 1887. We can't, I can't help but wonder about her life. Did she make that dress? What is the pen? And we've been actually trying to zoom and study because it looks like it has a bit of a military sort of sword um, sort of symbol. So what is her affiliation? Was she, was someone involved in the war? Was she, what, what is, who is is she? What is her name? How did she get to Helena, Montana? And where is her family now? Uh, these are important questions to ask and seek answers about because it reframes and expands narratives surrounding American history. Who's America and who's American? So unfortunately, I don't know much about her, but I know that J.P. Ball was an activist and a photographer. Ball was born in 1825 in Frederick County, Virginia, and learned the art of the daguerreotype by another free man of color, John Bailey. By the age of 20, Ball opened his first photography studio in Cincinnati, Ohio, a city that was heavily involved in anti-slavery activity. The business failed, however, but he became, and he became an itinerant photographer traveling to various parts of the South and Midwest. He served as the official photographer for the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation and his services were highly sought after by people like Frederick Douglass and Henry Highland Garnett. Ball eventually moved west with his son, 
J.P. Ball Jr., and they set up a shop in Helena, Montana around 1887. Ball was quite politically active in Montana. He promoted blacks moving to the West for a better life. He was active in pushing to make Helena, the state's capital. His son was the editor of the African-American newspaper in the area called The Colored Citizen. The elder Ball was eventually nominated for political office as a city coroner by the Republican Party, which I will say he declined. Unfortunately, he was eventually forced out of town for his photographic work for creating a three-part photograph of a fellow Montanian named William Biggerstaff. He showed Biggerstaff sitting for a photo in the ball studio, quite gorgeous, handsome, dapper gentleman. Then he showed him hanging from a rope with two white men next to him. Then he showed him lying dead in his coffin, all in the same three-piece suit. He is also wearing, as you can note, his wedding ring. This small image immediately makes you wonder, who did he leave behind? Was it the woman in the previous image? These are the things that Roland Barthes would call a punctum or an indelible impression. Through the set of images, the framing of the photograph, bigger staff's image of this, of bigger staff as a man is humanized. Oftentimes, the spectacle of the heinous crime is what was sent out and promoted, and you did, and the covered image, this man's face covered, he's no longer sort of considered human. But what Ball has done here, as he has shown this trajectory of, did this happen the same day? What were the circumstances behind this? And through the power of using Ball, using, or J.P. Ball, using his camera as a weapon to fight injustice, he was run out of town. And I think this then becomes sort of the ways in which we can understand the power of photography. We can use the photography as a way to try and right wrongs. I will end by showing this last sort of case study of this photographer um, from a different time period, if you will, from Henry Clay Anderson. Uh, who shot photographs primarily in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s in Mississippi. Uh, and he was one of the, this was one of the actual first major photography acquisitions by the museum. Um, and so we have over 5,000 images by Henry Clay Anderson. He was a minister, a photographer, uh, but he also really I think did another important aspect, again, of reframing people's understandings of, of sort of life, African-American life. Oftentimes when we think in our visual imagination of Mississippi or segregated South, you're not necessarily thinking about thriving communities or black folks on motorcycles hanging out in front of their own photo uh, store. But this is what, in fact, Anderson was looking to do, really kind of create opportunities to show a different story, a more fuller picture of African American life. So a lot of his images were really of, you know, sort of pageants and proms, again, everyday lives, making the extraordinary um, out of the ordinary. But there was one day when he took this picture, which I found to be, is one of the most profound images because he's showing violence without us seeing the victim. In fact, you know, prior to that, you may say that he was doing what Frederick Douglass would call sort of pictures with progress. But this one was really a startling image that he um, could not help but feel compelled to take. This was an image of a gentleman who later we find out was um, Reverend George Lee. He had been driving uh, from Bozoni, Mississippi, and he in fact was shot by a couple of men that were part of the White Citizens Council um, for trying to register to vote. 
he and his friend were involved in voting rights, his friend Gus Quartz, were involved in voting rights and voter registration, focusing primarily on this town. They drove up, and as they were driving to their house, he got, there was these two buckshots taken to his car. His car ran into a, a pole, and this is how uh, Henry Clay Anderson was able to take this photograph with the street light as his uh, sort of the light source for him to take this photograph. Uh, this, I should say, this case is considered uh, a cold case, a civil rights cold case. This incident was just one of several murders that occurred in Mississippi in 1955, including Emmett Till in August and Lamar Smith also in August. So it is this sort of work, this kind of opportunity for photographers to take their tool, if you will, and mark the moments of what is, has been taking place over the course of time and using that to humanize and really recognize the ways in which it's our responsibility as artists, or it can be our responsibility as artists, to sort of use that tool as a way to um, create opportunities for activism, for agency, and for us to each understand our roles to fully recognize each and every citizen as part of this country. Thank you so much. At this point, I think I can say good evening. Yeah. It's a true honor to be here and such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Susan Fisher Sterling, to Melani Douglas, who I feel very much are now book colleagues and friends. I met Susan now when I was, yes, maybe 13. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't know it, but you inspired me so much regarding modeling what excellence and leadership looks like for a woman. So thank you. Thank you. It's a true pleasure for me to be in conversation with my colleague and friend, Rhea Combs. Thank you for that fantastic presentation. I will uh, do the same, offer you a sense of the framework for my work, and leave hopefully adequate time for questions and, uh, and our conversation. I'd like to give you a sense of what brought me to edit the vision and justice issue of Aperture. And I'll do so by just framing it around a, a simple question that animates my thinking. Can art measure human life? It's not a question that we ask very often. We often think of measuring human life through vastly different means. Earning power, mortality rates, demography, but I think we're living in a moment today where we see the ways in which the image has been inaugurated as one of our main tactics for determining who counts in society, which is a mode of measuring human life. I want to think about this idea in a contemporary sense, which I'll do at the end, but really begin with the historic uh, roots of this idea. And for that, I'm going to start with a, a short clip. <laughs> we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness we, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, 
for the support of this declaration. Mutually pledge to each other. Our lives, our fortunes, and, and our, our sacred, sacred honor. honor. Extraordinary, isn't it? That's not meant to be an ad for Ancestry.com, but we should give it up for them for having created this with Jogo5, the creative agency. Why do you think this template of citizenship is being presented to us as a John Trumbull painting? The signing of the Declaration of Independence, which hangs in the Capitol here, you're seeing at the center, the commercial shows us the transit from that moment to the current day, where you see the descendants of those signers and the, pictured here in the Second Continental Congress in the near precise positions of the painting. 1790, citizenship is defined as being white and being male and being able to hold property. Is the journey from that day to the current one simply a legal narrative? Or is it also a cultural one? What are the episodes along that journey that let us see the ways in which we have pushed for a more inclusionary model of citizenship? This is how I teach the class at Harvard Vision and Justice, thinking through these episodes and structuring it along those lines. But it has become the framework for understanding the, the creation of the vision and justice issue as well. I was oriented to think through this idea, and I'll, I'll speak about the issue more in depth in a bit, because of the life of a man who I would be remiss in not thanking as I continue, and that man is Shadrach Emanuel Lee. He's my grandfather. <laughs> my name is Sarah Elizabeth Lewis, far less cool name than Shadrach Emanuel Lee. But I have his initials deliberately, S-E-L, and this is him pictured here. And you can tell who he is because I have his big forehead. Thank you very much. <laughs> Genetics. But with my great-grandfather, all here from the island of Montserrat, that small volcanic island in the Caribbean. Here, shown in Brooklyn, New York, in around 1910. He asked a question of his history teacher in the 11th grade, which animates my life journey. He wanted to know why the history textbooks presented excellence just one way. He wanted to know where African Americans were, where Asian Americans were, where Latinos were, where Native Americans were, where the whole world was. And the answer he received was that African Americans in particular had done nothing to merit inclusion. Didn't sit well with him. So he asked the question again <laughs> and again. And he was expelled for his impertinence in refusing to accept the answer. He never went back to high school. He never received a GED or college degree, but he became an artist. I'd like to think of him as a proto Kahende Wiley because he would insert into the very images that we might not see depicted with people of color, the very people of color that he knew should be there. He also became a jazz musician, playing back up with Count Basie and Duke Ellington. And I began to wonder, because of the force and the energy that he seemed to derive by creating images that better approximated his image of who counts in society, whether we weren't doing enough to understand the importance, the gravitas of images for justice in society. I, I think it is also a testament to this country that two generations later I can be teaching these very topics at Harvard with a grandfather who's expelled for wanting to do so. Whether or not you have a story like this in your own life, I think we've recently been uh, treated to images that remind us of the importance of images to inaugurate an expanded notion of who counts in society. Of course, showing you Amy Sherrill's masterful painting of Michelle Obama lovingly. Uh, gazed upon by President Obama. But perhaps more so through this image are we reminded of the ways in which images can inaugurate new possibilities, 
we're looking at a young two-year-old, Parker Curry, who was gazing at this painting so much so that her mother couldn't get her to turn around and face the camera or the, or the phone, really, uh, because she knew she was looking at a queen. That's what she said to her mother. But what I'd like to know, perhaps one day I can ask her mother, is why this image was set to detonation beyond the mastery that Amy Sherald has used here. What images might she have been naturally surrounded by that made this image force her to stand at attention at that young age of two? What I'd like to do now is just take you through a few case studies that get us to think about the work, the catalytic role of images for inaugurating new possibilities for collective society. I should also just say parenthetically, Susan mentioned that initially I was asked to speak about the rise and that book is about mastery and failure. And what that book allowed me to consider was the ways in which the arts have allowed us to overcome moments of collective failure, which is at the heart of justice. Think about this in the life of a young boy named uh, Charles Black Jr., who was himself in college in Austin, Texas, going to a dance, admittedly just to meet some girls, and found himself just instead transfixed by the power of this trumpet player, whom he had never heard of before. Turns out it was Louis Armstrong, king of the trumpet, and the year was 1931, and he knew that there was genius coming out of the body of this black man. And because of that, and because of that nearly alone, he felt that segregation must be wrong. Now, he was standing next to a friend of his from Austin High who recognized that genius too, but instead shook his head and uttered an epithet about African Americans commonly used during the day. But Charles Black Jr. knew. He decided that that would be the moment in which he began walking towards justice. He would go on to become one of the lawyers for the Supreme Court case, Brown versus Board of Education, that would go on to outlaw segregation. And he would inaugurate Louis Armstrong as the man who inspired this life-changing shift. He would teach at Columbia and Yale, and he would have an annual Armstrong listening night to honor the role that he played in his life. How many movements began when a work of art with aesthetic force so shifted someone's notions of the world entirely that we began a movement, that we created a leader? Often we fail to acknowledge the importance of images or performances, the arts, because we don't herald the private encounters in which these shifts occur that lead to public change. Frederick Douglass had a sense of this. During the Civil War, first in 1861 and again in 1865, he delivered a speech entitled Pictures in Progress in Boston's Tremont Temple, that integrated church one block from Boston Commons. That surprised his audience. They had they'd expected him to speak about anything else, really, but he spoke about what would have seemed like a trifle in the face of that nation-severing conflict, namely pictures and the force they have in the imagination. As my colleagues, Henry Louis Gates Jr., John Stauffer, Celeste Marie Benier have discovered Douglas is the most photographed man in the 19th century, not African-American man, American man. And why is this? What did Douglas know about, as Rhea Combs put it, the fact that representation matters? What sense of agency did he, did he derive from creating a counter-narrative that would go against the racist stereotypes that were being used to legitimate and to justify the exclusion of African-Americans from citizenship? Here he is in his study in his final home in Anacostia, as I imagine him redrafting the speech, as he did three times over the course of his life. Why would Douglas think about the importance of pictures at that moment? Well, we can speak about that a bit in the conversation, but I'd like to leave in your mind's eye an image that performs some of this work. Images were being used as a kind of data, they were being weaponized to naturalize the sense of racial hierarchies that we are still challenged to combat today. 
This image taken by the South Carolina-based Joseph T. Zeely was commissioned by, in fact, my predecessor at Harvard, Louis Agassiz, to try to prove polygenesis, to prove that African Americans were a separate, lower species. Here, we're looking at uh, Jack, a driver on a plantation, one of a set and of father and daughter pairs that were well, African and, and American born. I'll show you here an image of Renty on the left and the series created by Carrie Mae Weems. From here, I saw what happened and I cried that reframes this body of work to, to honor them. As Douglas was himself with images that were functioning as correctives against these mental images, these stereotypes that were being codified through photography, happening at the same time as the masterful work of a, of a J.P. Ball, right? Now, the work of images to move us past societal failure is something that came to mind here, and this is just for a bit of levity because it's a heavy topic we're speaking about tonight. When I saw this transcript of Martin Luther King's from seminary, now, you might be too far in the back to see, but in a transcript of A's and B's, he received um, two C's in, guess what class? Public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not once, but twice. So C plus to C. Shouldn't this be at the museum, Ria? I, th <laughs> I was stunned to see it and, and felt almost embarrassed to be looking at it, but of course you have to wonder what that teacher thought when he went on to lead the nation with the power of his spoken truth, <laughs> and what King must have thought when he knew who he was, as you imagine he did, and received those grades. But it made me think about the fact that I don't know where we would be without the prodigious work of the arts, and oratory is one of them for pushing past rational argument alone to get us to see past our blind spots to inaugurate a new moment of justice. With the time I have remaining, I'd like to just present um, images that might speak to those in the room, although maybe there are none in here, who, who might not yet buy the argument, who might not think that images are important for justice. I'd call your attention to images that have been so impactful in American history regarding the agitational work that they performed about belonging and inclusion that they were censored. Take for example the images that Dorothea Lang was commissioned to create to document Japanese internment. We're looking at the Shiboya family in front of their home in 1942, a family that was interned. Remember this policy interned, two-thirds of them were American citizens. This image was impounded by the government after she took it, as was this image of a Japanese businessman being tagged for removal. Migrant mother, of course, is what she's better known for, but this image as well was impounded by the government. And we can maybe speak about the visual rhetoric at work that offers a declamative, a, a mode of um, desire to proclaim entrance into the category of citizenship. Just for context, just for context, this is the ways in which images, photographs were also being used at the time. Think back to Joseph T. Zeely, whose image I just showed you. Consider the ways in which these photographs are being used to instruct the American public about who is an enemy and who is a neighbor or a citizen in showing the distinction between uh, Chinese nationals and Japanese nationals. It's not very long ago this occurred. We have here in Washington artists, of course, who have performed uh, and created the headwaters of the legacy that we'll be speaking about today with the contemporary photographers who continue this work in, say, at Gordon Parks. We also have photographers who allow us to consider how this impacts um, our indigenous brothers and sisters and looking at the, the history of how we've both naturalized the sense of the need to, uh, or the the legitimate manifest destiny that was uh, allowed for the expansion of the American West. Here you're looking at the Francis Benjamin Johnston image of, as the, sub, as the caption states, seven little Indians in four different stages of civilization. You're showing, they're showing you a telos of so-called progress, of so-called civilization, namely assimilation. And the Edward Curtis body of work as well, 
use as photographs to naturalize what I would call the, of course, an injustice here, the vanishing race Navajo, through the vanishing point of the image, suggesting the kind of natural state of extinction here, or of incursion onto what is rightfully native land. And we could also speak about the ways in which Ellis Island created images as a form of data to document who was allowed to enter and who was not. This topic that we're speaking about is crucial today. We make as many images in three minutes as are made in the entire 19th century. We are awash with images as much as perhaps Frederick Douglass felt that he was. And so for me, it was a natural yes uh, when Michael Famigetti at Aperture and Chris Boot asked me to guest edit this issue. I did agitate for uh, two covers, though. They typically have one. This is the Richard Avedon cover that shows, of course, Martin Luther King Jr. with his father and his son insistently gazing out on us, as I hoped it reminded us of the fact that we are in lineage with this larger idea. And that this is, of course, a historic topic. But through the second cover, I attempted to, to show that this is also a contemporary one. An image here by Awal Arescu, a former a student of mine at Yale, who's Ethiopian born and LA based, and is known for kind of breaking the internet with all his photographs of Beyonce pregnant. Have you seen those? That, that's Awal. <laughs> He's often known for images like this, that are appropriate grandmaster paintings. Here, his sister actually in the frame, entitled Girl with a Bamboo Earring. <laughs> But the work of the issue is to consider through the framework of Frederick Douglass's idea about the importance of images for justice, the, the prodigious works of contemporary photographers who are taking up this mantle, such as Awal Rescu, and filmmakers like Ava DuVernay and Bradford Young, photographers like Dina Lawson, and to marry their work with the lyricism of scholars and poets and writers, such as Claudia Rankin, Henry Louis Gates Jr., and others. My hope is that together, it gives us a sense of how images actually structured the very contours of society. Because I don't have time to take you through it, I just want to leave you with one kind of emblematic image and then show you a clip that my, my students and I put together for the Kennedy Center. Uh, this image for me, summarizes what every photographer is effectively stating. Many of you have probably seen it. Here we're looking at a young Jacob Philadelphia, just five years old, having been allowed to ask the president just one question. I imagine he had many <laughs> of the president. And here he's decided to ask whether the president's hair texture really does match his own. And gallantly, President Obama's leaning down to let him touch the evidence. It's framed masterfully by Pete Souza, former White House photographer. And you see he's included the, the Oval Office seal, of course, on the carpet, and his brother gazing on whose life path, as you can imagine, this Jacob Philadelphia's was, is likely altered in that moment. His parents as well, of course, in the frame. What, as was the case with the two-year-old Parker Curry, might Jacob Philadelphia have been surrounded by regarding images that made him need to touch the evidence? Right? What work does an image perform that inaugurates new, new possibility? And just one more for fun. I, I <laughs> performs a similar work here, too. You might not have seen this one. Have you seen it? No? Yes? No. This is of a young girl who was in kindergarten and was visiting the White House with her parents, part of the Wounded Veterans event. And she was worried that she was going to get in trouble for missing a day of school. And so she asked the president to write her a note <laughs> so she wouldn't get in trouble. Now, I hope the museum here invites her at some point in her life to speak, because I wonder, I actually know what she's going to do with her life. Look at that self-possession. <laughs> and look at how seriously he's taking the task. Five years old, and she can command the president to do this. OK. So <laughs> I love her, her spirit, um, dressed to the nines. But again, 
framed masterfully by Pete Souza with the painting of George Washington in the far background, with the veterans in the midground, as if suggesting the journey and narrative that's allowed us to arrive at this moment, the sacrifice required. When the vision and justice issue of Aperture came out, it was a surprise to me that it um, performed the kind of work it did in the world. It sold 20,000 copies in seven weeks. It's in its third printing right now. It's now being sold as a book as opposed to a magazine issue. And Rhea and I might speak about some of the other initiatives that are coming out of it. But one surprise as well was that the Kennedy Center wanted to create a multimedia piece out of the issue. And so in collaboration with my students, we set to um, this speech given by John F. Kennedy to eulogize Robert Frost entitled Power and Poetry, Images from the Vision and Justice Issue of Aperture. This speech by President Kennedy speaks to the role of the artist for justice, and it's a very short clip. So I'm going to play that for you now, and because no one can really follow Kennedy, I'm not going to say very much afterwards. Um, I might need some help toggling between. Okay. Oh. If sometimes our great artists have been the most critical of our society, it is because their sensitivity and their concern for justice, which must motivate any true artist, makes him aware that our nation falls short of its highest potential. I see little of more importance to the future of our country and our civilization than full recognition of the place of the artist. If art is to nourish the roots of our culture, society must set the artist free to follow his vision wherever it takes him. We must never forget that art is not a form of propaganda, it is a form of truth. And as Mr. McLeish once remarked, of poets, there is nothing worse for our trade than to be in style. In free society, art is not a weapon and it does not belong to the sphere of polemics and ideology. Artists are not engineers of the soul. It may be different elsewhere, but democratic society, in it, the highest duty of the writer, the composer, the artist, is to remain true to himself and to let the chips fall where they may. In serving his vision of the truth, the artist best serves his nation. And the nation which disdains the mission of art invites the fate of Robert Frost's hired man, the fate of having nothing to look backward to with pride and nothing to look forward to with hope. I look forward to a great future for America, a future in which our country will match its military strength with our moral restraint, its wealth with our wisdom, its power with our purpose. I look forward to an America which will not be afraid of grace and beauty, which will protect the beauty of our natural environment, which will preserve the great old American houses and squares and parks of our national past, and which will build handsome and balanced cities for our future. I look forward to an America which will reward achievement in the arts as we reward achievement in business or statecraft. I look forward to an America which will steadily raise the standards of artistic accomplishment and which will steadily enlarge cultural opportunities for all of our citizens. And I look forward to an America which commands respect throughout the world, not only for its strength, 
but for its civilization as well. And I look forward to a world which will be safe, not only for democracy and diversity, but also for personal distinction. So my hope is that you can now see why I don't believe in the arts as merely a respite from life, a kind of luxury. But instead, see the arts as, in fact, the tactics that we use to create the more just society in which we are honored to live. Thank you.